California's gold is produced in association with KCET Los Angeles and is seen statewide on California public television. This series is endorsed by the California Teachers Association, the California School Boards Association, and the California Library Association. Hello everybody, I'm Hewell Hauser, and here we are on Scotts Valley Drive in the nice little community of Scotts Valley, about six miles north of Santa Cruz. Now we have come here to visit a very historic spot. And at first glance, it may look like just an unpaved parking lot with some cars and it's kind of overgrown back in the back. But you know what? California history can be deceiving and it can also be hidden because we have it on the very highest authority that this place, this spot, with the history it has and the human story it tells, is a fine example of California's gold. Well, the adventure begins. I'm standing here with our tour guides, Mark and Wilma, now we've already introduced this adventure as saying that back in that clump of trees over there is a fine example of California's gold, a real interesting part of California history. Was I right in setting it up that way? There's treasure back there. Okay, tell us what we're talking about. This is the site on Scotts Valley Drive, which was the old tourist road into Santa Cruz, California, of the world famous tree circus. The tree circus? The tree circus. It was the creation of Axel Erlinson, a retired farmer who for a hobby grew and trained trees into the most fantastic shapes in the history of horticulture. Okay, that, boy, that summed it up very quickly, very succinctly. The story was, wasn't it, that he, Axel, and his family used to live over in Turlock, over in the San Joaquin Valley, that he grew these trees really as a hobby, and then somebody suggested that he move them over here closer to Santa Cruz so that he could make a tourist attraction out of them. Absolutely. This was a hobby for Axel, who was a farmer in the Central Valley, but he was getting on in years, in his 60s. He dug up those trees, loaded them on a flatbed truck, and moved them and transplanted them here in, in Scotts Valley and created this roadside attraction. Opened up something called the Tree Circus. And Wilma, wasn't that your idea to name it the Tree Circus? Uh, yes, that was my idea. At first, they just had a sign that said, see the world's strangest trees here. Then later, I suggested that title, and he changed it and called it the Tree Circus. Now, you grew up watching your dad make these amazing shapes out of these trees. Did you know from the earliest days that he was on to something, that this was something pretty unusual? Uh, not really. I was just a kid, and this was things he did, and, and it didn't seem that unusual to me. That but he was really into this, wasn't he? Yes, he certainly was. What got him started doing it? Well, he saw some trees with natural grafts, and he decided to experiment and see what he could do, and that's what it turned out to be. He thought he could do just as well as what he had seen. Well, he was hoping so, and he tried. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's walk down in here, because this is where the tree circus stood. This is where thousands of tourists for years, starting in 1947, would come to visit the tree circus and set the stage for us. What would we have seen when we got out of the car right on the side of this busy tourist highway? What would it have looked like? Well, you would turn in here and Axel had built a beautiful little castle that he and his family lived in. And to the right of the castle, was a tree that created an arch, and you walked under the arch through a beautiful topiary hedge, a gateway in a hedge, and stepped right in under the four-legged giant, which was a, four, a tree with four legs that you could stand beneath. Wow. Uh, you know, Axel charged 25 cents to go in. Uh, he was doing this on a really tight budget. He had no uh, budget for, uh, you know, publicity and advertisement. He just hoped that people would come in. The ones who did were thrilled. Between 1947 and 1963, 20,000 people visited. Really? But at 20 cent, 25 cents a head, 
That hardly paid the bills. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's all kind of grown up today, but we can get back in there. So we're going to head back in and visit up close and personal with the tree circus. We're inside the tree circus. And Mark, how big was the tree circus at its heyday? Tree Circus was three quarters of an acre. It was surrounded by a topiary hedge and a fence, and it contained 75 specimens of 75 different trees. Of unique trees. So once he got started, he really went to town. That's right. He did, sure did. Was he obsessed by this? Uh, I think so. And they were so unusual, and we have these pictures of them, that people had really never seen anything like this before. Oh, absolutely. You know, people use techniques for horticulture, pleaching and grafting, approach grafting, but nobody had taken all these techniques and put them together in such an intricate and controlled way. It looks to me like this would have taken years to do for these trees to grow in these shapes. Trees don't grow that fast, do they? Some uh, grow faster than others, but the, to achieve the form of each tree, and some of them had forms that were 12 or 14 feet high, would take anywhere from 5 to 10 or 11 years. Well, it's hard to have a roadside attraction with things that are not grown yet. Well, Axel uh, had grown some of these trees uh, back in the Central Valley, and he started the uh, attraction with a dozen trees that he dug up and moved here on a flatbed truck. So he had some living trees. He had some uh, trees that, uh, small trees that had died that he, or that he had uh, cut to display here. So he started with a small display and kept the place open on weekends during the summer. And, uh, and then when he finally got to the point where he had a critical mass of trees, he could do this full time. And would he give the tour himself? What would he, how, how, how did it operate? Uh, he did most of the tours himself. Sometimes my mother or I would do one, but he did most of it. So it was a family operation. That's right. And what was it you told me he would tell people when they would ask him how he grew these trees? Oh, well, when children would ask him sometimes, he would say, oh, I just talked to them. <laughs> this was the quintessential Americana roadside California attraction, wasn't it? This was, the timing for Axel was perfect in that this was post-war, people coming back to the States, uh, suburban uh, couples in their homes with their families and their cars going on day trips, and this was the road to be on in uh, Santa Cruz. And we're standing here by a remnant of the tree circus. Tell us what we're looking at. This is the corkscrew tree. This the is the corkscrew tree. Yes, it's difficult to tell now because the tree has grown so fast and so f so broad that it's concealed the fact that it was two limbs that were twisted around each other. Twisted like this. Exactly. So you can see the twist. Going exactly, out. and then grafted together into one tree at the top. And uh, this was very dramatic when you saw it years ago when the uh, when each trunk was of a diameter and separate from each other. Do you remember this tree? Yes, I do. Was this one of your favorites too? Oh, I don't know. Some of the others were more favorites. Some of them were much more complicated than this one. Yeah, this, so one this was nothing here. This was an early experiment. <laughs> this was easy for Axel. Well, the place is totally grown up here. And Mark, that gets into the rest of the story because Let's talk just a little bit about your involvement in this whole story, how you got involved in it. Well, I came here after graduating from architecture school, and my interest was the notion of growing trees to create architecture. The tree circus had been abandoned for years, but when I came out here and discovered the living chairs and spiral staircases and towers that Axel had grown, it was as though all the, all the images and all the forms that I had dreamt of, Axel had actually created. He developed the technology to do that. And let's, let's chronicle the history. Axel sold the circus, the tree circus, in 1963. He died a year later. And in subsequent years, through the 60s and 70s and early 80s, the tree circus really had a, a myriad of owners. It never really regained the luster that it had had when Axel 
uh, ran it and loved it and cared for it, and it was almost destroyed. It was. You know, the, uh, the new Highway 17 came in behind the tree circus, so there was no longer tourist traffic along the street, and that really was the death knell for this roadside attraction. So after Axel sold it, it became uh, a, something called Lost World, where people put dinosaurs in here hoping to attract cars off the highway, but it did not succeed. That didn't work. That didn't work. And then in the, uh, in the mid-70s, uh, amidst uh, California's severe drought, which uh, unfortunately killed many of the trees, a developer bought the property with the idea of doing a commercial development here. He was going to bulldoze all the trees down. Yeah, it was a liability to him, these trees on this property. And that's, that got your juices going to try to save the trees. And you tried to, to, to have them saved in a number of ways, tried to get different entities interested in them. Oh, I tried to get them preserved locally, tried to get local government involved, tried to get uh, regional muse museums involved, collectors, did a, a great deal of publicity. Uh, was, we were on television with the trees many times. Didn't uh, you have an open house here? We had an open house uh, in one April. This is many years ago. Uh, we had publicity in the Bay Area, and we had close to uh, 7,000 people came. Really? To yeah. see the trees? Yes. And of course, it was a discovery for everyone to come here and see such magnificent things that were unfortunately in a very threatened condition. Well, I'll tell you what, if you look at, the, at what used to be the tree circus right now, this is one of the few trees left and by all appearances, this is not a story that had a very happy ending. But the wonder of it all is, is that there was, there is a happy ending to all this. And that's what we're going to do right now, is visit the happy ending for the circus trees. Okay, the adventure continues. We have left Scotts Valley and we have come about 30 miles southeast to the town of Gilroy. Specifically, we're at the Bonfante Gardens, which is a family theme park that focuses on beautiful gardens and trees. And this is the new home of the circus trees. And there's one of them right there. Come on, Mark. Come on, Wilma. Let's take a look at it. It says right here that this is the basket tree. Now, Mark, is this one of the original trees from Scotts Valley? This is one of those trees, one of those beautiful, magnificent trees that's got its new home here. It's healthy, it's thriving, and we're just really pleased to see it. And this is a complicated looking tree, too. Explain how that was done. Well, once again, Axel planted six trees in a circle in the ground and wove the branches together as they grew. And over time, the branches were grafted together, it became one tree, and you see it uh, it continued on its growth uh, 30, 40 feet above the ground. Now, was this tree, when it was moved from Scotts Valley, was it moved in, in this configuration this big? Was it cut back? Well, the outer branches would have been cut back so that uh, they could move on the highway and also so that uh, it would require less water and uh, be able to sustain itself. But it quickly recovered when it got here, and now it's it's full grown. It's a magnificent tree. And as it grows, will these little holes in here, the basket part of the tree, will they stay the same, or will they uh, contract and grow? And Well, the tree only grows from the, the ends of the branch tips. Those basket shapes will continue to thicken with time, and eventually, sadly, the tree will close in, all those gaps will close in, and then we'll have a tree like a tube. It'll be open on the inside, but you won't be able to see in. Well, that's going to take a long time. It's going to take some years. <laughs> it's going to take some years. Now, Wilma, is this one of your favorite trees? Yes, that is one of my favorite trees. Why is that? Well, it is, it's so even, all the stems are so even in it, and it, uh, uh, it's just, it's just perfect. Continuing our tour through the park, how many trees, how many circus trees are here, Mark? Well, there are 19 of those trees for the public to see here. Boy, and we've come upon one right here. Look at this. This is absolutely wonderful. Now, I can't remember all their names. What's this one called? Oh, uh, this is obviously the arch tree. All right, let's stand right under the arch. 
Now, is this one of your favorites, Wilma? Uh, yes, I think this is one of my favorites. <laughs> they're all your I favorites. I have a lot of favorites. How would he have done this, Mark? Well, again, two trees planted eight feet apart. He would have had a frame to create this graceful arc pattern for the branches to grow, and then would graft them at the top to form one tree. So two trees grafted into one that has, and you know, I'm surprised at the size of these trees. I know, and then you look at how healthy it is now here at this park, how huge the crown of this tree is. This tree is gonna last and live for a very long time. When do you think he started this? Well, he actually started this tree uh, outside his tree circus. This was the entry arch. Everybody walked underneath this arch on the way in. So he would have started this tree maybe about 1947, 1948. So over the years, thousands and thousands and thousands of people have walked through this arch tree. Well, that's right. <laughs> Everybody that comes to see the park here or where they were in Scotts Valley, they walk under this tree. And add three more to it because we're walking through the arch tree right now. Come on. Here's another tree. And Wilma, I bet you know where every one of these 19 trees are in this park, don't you? Well, I think I can find all of them. I'm not quite sure. You've been here and looked at them. You check on them all the time, don't you? Yeah, I come over every once in a while, but right. they're scattered around. And... Now, what is this one right here? This is a great tree right here. This is the four-legged giant. The four-legged giant. And they're the four legs right here. And Mark, this is a real work of art right here. A wonderful work of art and the oldest one in the whole collection. Now, how do we know it's the oldest? Well, there are photographs. Uh, Axel grew this back in Hilmar on his farm. It was his first experiment with four trees planted, you know, six feet apart in a square and pruned above his head so he could stand under that tree. And he photographed himself under that tree with his family on numerous occasions. Now, isn't it interesting that the oldest tree has survived and it looks just healthy as it can be? It's been through a lot. That tree has moved twice and it is absolutely healthy right now. Now how old, how far back does that go? That tree probably goes back at least 70 years. Well, well you remember this that tree. tree is about the same age I am. And I was 75. Now has this always been one of your favorite trees? I bet it was your dad's because it was the first one he did. Yes, that's one of my favorite ones too. So when he started this, he wasn't sure that it was going to work. This was his first experimental tree. It was just a hobby at the time. It was a fascination that he had. And of course, over time, it became a real love and a real obsession. But this was that first try, you know, the, one of those, I wonder if I could get a tree to do this. It just keeps getting better and better. Look at this. This is spectacular. Now, Mark, what in the world was he thinking about? What was he trying to do when he created this look? Well, you know, Axel grew many functional shapes. He grew chairs and spiral staircases and ladders, but sometimes he just grew designs that came out of his own head, his own imagination, just shapes and forms that he liked. He grew designs. He grew designs, and this is one of them. It was just a pattern that he wanted to create, circle on the inside, two trees growing to form uh, one and then spreading again, and then in the end coming together as one tree. Now this is two trees, you can tell from the bottom, but then it branches off on that side, it branches off on that side, it goes up the middle and branches off again and goes up and branches off again, come back together and, and up to go. the top. You're right. Two to one to three to two to three to one. Wow. Why not? If you can do it, why not? Now this was, was this revolutionary when he did this? Well, you know, Axel was working not in the world of uh, international science. He was inventing this himself. And my research showed me that no one else in the world had matched what he had done. So yeah, this was revolutionary, but very quiet revolution. The rest of the world wasn't aware of it when he was Well, doing they're it. aware of it now. They're seeing it every day here in this park. Yes, and thanks to this show, many more will see it too. Now, I'm getting pretty good at spotting these trees. Mark, what's the name of this tree right here? Oh, some call it the egg beater tree. Some call it the, the three, two, one tree. The egg beater tree. And here we go. Oh, I got you. This is the egg beater right here. That's right. And it starts off with four different 
four uh, different loops. Then it goes up to three, and then it goes up to two. Now, what in the world was going through his mind on this one? I think Axel was just enjoying himself on this one. <laughs> Probably so. <laughs> Sometimes maybe we're attributing too much thought. Maybe it was just kind of serendipity when he would get out in the yard and start playing with these things. They'd just kind of come together. I think Axel experimented with perhaps over 100 different designs. Some worked, some didn't. Some uh, got, grew very fast and healthy, and they, uh, they're here today. Others. Uh, uh, you know, had problems or one branch didn't take or a graft didn't work. This is one that uh, obviously he was very successful with, creating these loops and winding up with a nice healthy tree at the top. Okay, we're ending up here in the front of the park in front of the curly, curvy tree. And what's interesting, they've got five on each side here as you walk into the park. And Mark, these trees are a little different from all the rest. We've been looking at sycamore trees up to now. I know, and here we see ash trees and box elders and oaks. Axel worked with a dozen different types of trees. And we're ending up here in front of this one, which is a very interesting tree because as you move around it, it gives you kind of an optical illusion. Well, Axel was a self-trained uh, surveyor, and he knew geometry inside and out, and he enjoyed it with his trees. And what's interesting about this is that when you come here to Bonfanti Gardens and see Axel's trees and think about how close they came to extinction, to not being around anymore at all. Well, you know, Axel struggled for years to bring people to his own park. And there are more people in a week come to Bonfanti Gardens than in the lifetime of, uh, of Axel's Tree Circus. So it's uh, remarkable to see this and to think that it once was an abandoned roadside attraction. Absolutely. And Wilma, what do you think your dad would think oh, about the new home here? I think he'd be very pleased with it. They did a wonderful job the way they took care of them and planted them and located them. I, it's just marvelous. And I really enjoy coming through here every once in a while myself and looking at them. Well, I hope they give you a free pass to come in and out whenever you want to. They should if they don't, because this is an amazing place, Bonfanti Gardens, here in Gilroy, this amazing place with these amazing trees. Your father's trees are alive and well in this beautiful new home. That's right. There is in the world no place like it. Proclaimed by sign a tree circus, it is more than that. It is a fantasy forest shaped by one man's skill, imagination, and loving care. Alex Erlinson of Santa Cruz, California, is a sculptor of trees, an artist who molds living creations, fashioning strange twists in nature's work. The puzzle tree is a weeping willow that actually started out as two trees. The trunks were joined together through a series of loops, bends, and twists into a single stem. Far less complex, but just as amazing, is the heart tree, a living valentine. Splitting the trunk, shaping the heart, and joining the wood again was a task that required almost ten years. Two box elders, linked forever by nine living rungs, form the ladder tree, the easiest tree in the world to climb. The corkscrew tree is a perfect winding spiral. The variety of shapes in the tree circus is seemingly endless, each differing in thought and execution. Clown of the show is a giant sycamore, the jumping jack tree, it is a favorite of the youngsters who duck in and out of its rooted feet. Just as this looped birch tree puzzles humans, so too does it confuse a caterpillar struggling to climb the trunk which bends inward. The zigzag tree illustrates Mr. Erlinson's unique ability to achieve remarkable shapes without injury to the living tree. There are more than 60 healthy, growing specimens in his circus. 
an acacia Indian teepee offers boys and girls a tree house with a window for each pair of eyes, eyes wide with wonder at these strange and startling sights. Every step brings new evidence of the beauty to be found in this fantasy forest. The diamond tree is a white ash, one of a dozen species sculptured by Mr. Erlinson to dazzle the imagination. The Believe It or Not tree, named by Robert Ripley, has a trunk five inches in diameter that is tied in a perfect knot four feet above the ground. Typical of the planning and patient care required in arboriculture are two spectacles of nature, the eyeglass trees. Like all mature trees, they will gain no more in height, only in width. But because Mr. Erlinson can actually forecast their growth, they will always retain their perfectly proportioned shape. Each tree is a living monument, a creation that will grow and endure, standing tall in tribute to a naturalist who for 30 years has been a sculptor of trees. Well, hello everybody, I'm Huell Hauser, and I sure hope you enjoyed our visit to California's own circus trees at Bonfanti Gardens in Gilroy. Now, it is definitely worth a visit to see them for yourself. And if you'd like to see this particular adventure again, of course, it's available on video cassette and on DVD. All you have to do is call 1-800-266-5727, and we'll be glad to send it to you right away.